I just have a couple of things I want to say. I'll try to be brief. I was hired in, uh, by Ed Feigenbaum and, and Josh Lederberg in 1966 to work with Georgia Sutherland on, on a task that nobody told us was probably impossible. But the tone at the lab at the time, which was set by Les and, and John and everybody, was that nothing is impossible. So we came into that. Uh, I was hired straight with a fresh uh, PhD right out of a Midwestern university in philosophy. So what I knew about computer science and the possibilities was very limited. Uh, there were people at the lab. Uh, John was working on chess, among other things, being a master chess player himself. Uh, John Chowning, a musician. Uh, Tony Hearn certainly knew symbolic algebra. Uh, Ken Colby, professional psychiatrist. All these people were programming in areas that they knew something about. I was hired to work in chemistry. Uh, so uh, as a philosopher, I was trying to decide how, how in the world do you do that? Uh, Georgia had a concept she called table-driven programming. And we later evolved that into what became known as rule-based expert systems, where uh, the central idea was that you gather uh, some knowledge of a task area from somebody who knows something and put it into a nice simple representation that uh, can be manipulated by a program. Uh, and in fact, then, that allows a pro another program to learn uh, from the outside, learn how to change the those data structures. What we came, what I came to recognize years later was that this was an idea that John McCarthy had published in 1959. Uh, in the advice taker paper, and let me just read a couple of, of sentences from that. Uh, Our ultimate objective, John said, is to make programs that learn from their experience as effectively as humans do. Uh, in our opinion, a system which is to evolve intelligence of human order should have at least the following features. And two of them are, all behaviors must be representable in the system. Therefore, the system should either be able to construct arbitrary automata or to program in some general purpose language. The second uh, of five, interesting changes in behavior must be expressible in a simple way. Then he concludes, we base ourselves on the idea that in order for a program to be capable of learning something, it must first be capable of being told it. Now, that was the guiding principle, as it turns out, for the rest of my research life. And uh, Tom Mitchell uh, took, took this up. We were working on learning those data structures that were needed to interpret uh, analytical uh, mass spectra in, in analytical chemistry. And uh, Tom began to simplify what we were doing and make it conceptually understandable to the rest of the world. Uh, and that put a, a new spark in what Art Samuel had started years before with his checker player. But uh, for many years, that seminal work of Art Samuel's was just languishing, and Tom, Tom gave it an, a very nice push. Uh, one of Tom's distinguished graduates is Sebastian Thrun. So, in a sense, I am Sebastian's intellectual grandfather. <laughs> uh, let me just read uh, a little bit what I wrote about the sale environment. At the time we were there, this, I wrote this uh, as an introduction to this, the sale uh, report series in the 80s. Uh, the sale environment became a special part of AI research at Stanford. Different individuals saw different features. No one would categorize it as mundane. The physical location was one important aspect, another the computing environment, another the strange social environment created <laughs> by intense young people whose first love was hacking. <laughs> Les Ernest had come to the lab as executive officer to manage the ARPA contract late in 1965. Much of the freedom that characterized life at sale is due to Les, sheltering the research staff from regulation. <laughs> Shall 
sheltered from regulations and paperwork. Nobody hated paperwork more than less, and nobody took on more, I think. <laughs> the move to the DC power building and the rolling foothills behind campus also created a sense of spontaneity that former staff members and visitors readily recall. The social environment at SAIL was distinctive. <laughs> From the time the hackers, both students and non-students, installed the sauna and discovered they could sleep in the attic space above the ceiling. <laughs> People were at the lab 24 hours a day. They invented gadgets to make their lives easier and more fun. Radio-controlled channel selector on the TV. A coupling between the vending machine and computer to dispense snacks, charging them to personal accounts. Uh, several of these other things you've already heard about. Yet, for all the diversions, it was a supportive, friendly environment in which the super hackers or wizards, to use the term from The Hobbit, willingly helped the rest of us understand how to make the system work. One of the near magical qualities of the sale atmosphere was the sense of experimentation in which any problem was fair game. No one had been told about NP-complete problems. Interesting, <laughs> interesting problems just appeared to be hard or very hard. Feigenbaum used to say he could often get students to solve very hard problems as long as he didn't tell them how difficult the, more se the seasoned researchers had found them. John McCarthy was known to assign programming the four-color map problem as a homework <laughs> exercise. <laughs> Systems programmers fearlessly modified the PDB-6 operating system to support the unusual peripheral devices around the lab. Among other things, I remember living in fear of a PDB-6 bug that would draw the hackers out from the back with soldering irons. <laughs> the physical environment enhanced the sense of living in a fantasy world with only a wall of glass separating the natural beauty of the foothills from what seemed then, and still does, to be the 21st century technology. So that's what I wrote uh, 25 years ago. I believe every word of it. It was a magical place. Thank you, John, and thank you, Les.